Well, sir, I had one to follow, but we'll try with a couple of great speakers. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Today we begin our 18th year of all world uh, powers meetings. And that's a lot of entertainment, it's a lot of great friendships, shared information, uh, a lot of fun, and certainly a lot of camaraderie. But when you think about it, what is it really? It's really a monthly great uh, gap fest. One great consolidated session of hang a fly. That's what we do. When you think about it, 18 years of bad jokes, tall truths, gross, gross exaggerations, uh, and of course, total unadulterated BS. <laughs> um, anyhow, by the turn up today, it looks like everybody has enjoyed that. So, we started our year with something a little different. We started our year with a surprise, uh, a surprise we call Legends of Flight. We are here to honor two men. His contributions of courage and innovation, uh, his skill helped propel the US in the position of uh, air superiority, and whose uh, early efforts helped launch Americans into space. They are the true pioneers of high speed flight and high speed uh, and uh, high altitude flight. Now, it may be a surprise to you, uh, not knowing who they are, but it's also a surprise to them. Because as they sit here, they do not know, either of them, who they are and whether they're going to be honored today or not. So, let me first thank those who were my co conspirators in setting up today's uh, speakers and getting them here. And uh, also, a quick word of thanks to Phil Coburn. Where are they, Phil? Oh, he's down there. He helps us out, uh, as you know, with our. Uh, uh, technology and uh, we couldn't do it without him. Phil is uh, taping the session today for posterity and you guys should know that you can see all our speakers on our website by going on there and we download the videos on that website and also put them on YouTube so if you're away or out of town you want to share them with someone go to the old old website and they'll be available to you. Uh, so today here's how we're going to play it. Um, we've invited a couple of our honorees closest friends to introduce them, after all, who know them better than their best friends. Um, and then later on we'll have them back here for some questions, so say some good questions for them if you would. Uh, to get started, let me introduce, uh, if I may, a respected don uh, of the Thermal Mafia. Come on up here, Dick Walsh. <laughs> Thank you. 
few pictures of the that beautiful airplane that uh, probably will never be uh, have another one like it again. Box 3.3 with its normal cruise altitude or at a speed of around 85,000 feet. That much of us ever get up that high. With uh, speed in his blood, Gerald decided to fly in the Reno Air Races that were resurrected in 1962. It was 63. He won the Reno uh, race in 1964 and was drawn F8 F Bearcat and went on to win five of the next seven races at Reno. In 1969, Darrell set a new speed record that had been held by a German since 1939. <coughs> He did it in his modified uh, bear cap, and it was set at 483 miles per hour. For a speed record, Darrell was inducted into the National Aerospace Hall of Fame that year with a couple of other fellas that had been to the moon on Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong, Will Dalton, and Michael Collins. This is the... Uh, one version of his highly modified rear uh, cat. You put the mic up to your lips. Get the mic up to your lips, please. Uh, this is a uh, one of his versions of his rear cat. Uh, he kept modifying it during the race period. <laughs>
a friend persuaded him to let him rebuild it and uh, take it to drag strips. So you can see this uh, today uh, at different drag strips in Southern California. They take it out and uh, run it up and down the track once in a while. That's the old style drag strip which they don't uh, use today where the pilot sat over the rear wheel with the drive shaft between his legs. I can't imagine that one. <laughs> Uh, one of uh, Daryl's greatest ambitions uh, and adventures was the retrieval of a B-29 off the glacier in uh, Greenland. This occurred in uh, 1993 to 1995. Uh, it was filmed by uh, Nova. It was on TV in six different segments. Uh, and uh, it was quite an adventure. Here's a few pictures. Uh, the plane has sat there since 1946 until 1993, and they went up there and replaced all the engines, the props, uh, resurfaced all the fabric on the uh, controls, repaired the belly and the bottom bay doors. Uh, that's how they found it up there in Greenland uh, Green when they first saw it. They worked. Uh, 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 four different trips. They flew a plane in there with all the engines on it and uh, repaired them. This is some old footage from the Second World War that uh, is part of the uh, Nova documentary. And if you want to see the documentary, you can actually get it on YouTube. It's in six different segments that you. Google uh, B-29 and Greenland Glacier, uh, you'll see all six segments come up and you can watch it. Daryl uh, Grindemeyer, there's a test picture uh, has been working uh, on a bold plan, plan to rescue the B-29 and fly it back. Uh, adventurer there trying to put some new engines on it. Daryl has flown higher and faster than most other living pilots. He had once been a test pilot on the U-2 spy plane and its replacement, the SR-71 Blackbird. In the 70s, he built his own Starfighter jet from spare parts to gain a low-altitude speed record, which he still holds. An accomplished pilot and engineer used to taking risks. If anyone could pull this off, it was Daryl. It is a unique opportunity. It may be the only airplane in the world that I can think of that's been sitting somewhere for 50 years that you could actually get in and potentially fly. It's just in a faraway place. That's, that's the reason it's available. But getting the keybird into the air requires more than skill and boldness. The bulk of the heavy supplies and machinery that Daryl would need has to be carried to Thule on the annual supply ship. A five-ton bulldozer will be needed to build a runway for the B-29. Bulky new tires and propellers are also required, along with four massive reconditioned radial engines. All of this equipment has to be carried north over the 250 miles of desolate Arctic landscape that separates Thule from the bomber. Daryl's solution is a 1962 Caribou, another of his salvaged wonders. It's basically a short field, you know, short landing and takeoff airplane, and it's made for unimproved fields. They use it in Vietnam a lot. And it's it's a pretty rugged airplane. It's ideal for this sort of thing, flying these engines in, and it'll carry a pretty good load. Rick Kriege, who had been Daryl's chief engineer for over seven years, is responsible for making his plans work. With the Caribou's arrival in mid-July, Daryl's team is complete. Cecilio Grandi has been Rick's assistant for three years, learning on the job. Dirt doesn't go through the filter. Vernon Rich is a toolmaker and machinist. And Bob Vanderveen, as well as being another pair of hands, is going to do the cooking. Roger von Grote, a retired airline pilot and a distant relative of Baron von Richthofen, 
will fly the caribou. Daryl and the others take off from Thule. flight takes them over uncharted mountains and glaciers 250 miles north. It is a risky journey into the unknown where the chances of rescue are slim. Finally, they come to the valley where the B-29 came to rest. They fly low over the valley floor. Roger lowers the wheels and makes a brief touchdown to test how firm the surface is. It seems fine. So they go around and come in to make a landing. If anything goes wrong now, the consequences could be fatal. Operation up there. The uh, tank to you that was used to start the engines uh, caught on fire and just spread through the whole airplane. And they, bar they barely got out of the airplane in time. And uh, had to sit but there and watch it, it uh, move down the valley. The relief and euphoria spills out as they examine their landing strip. Anybody needs some good 3350 engines, there's four of them sitting up there with about 15 minutes of running time on them. I think Daryl will probably allow you to have them if you don't want to go up and get them. Uh, in 19, uh, we get Darrell moved on after that experience. In 1998, he started racing at the Reno Sport Class uh, Racing, which was a new class at Reno. He went on to win five of the Sport Class races in the next eight years at Reno, and he quit racing about five years ago. In uh, 2007, Darrell uh, reassembled a Grumman F7F Tiger Cat. Uh, a lot of you may have never seen these. They, they came about at the end of the Second World War and never saw action in the Second War and a little bit during the Korean War. Bill had acquired one on a trade from the Air Force Museum, the Marine Museum, in the 1980s. Flew it for a while here in Southern California and then disassembled it. Uh, in 19, uh, say 2007, he decided to reassemble it. And he brought it down here and I helped him uh, put it back together. And we got it all, it took us a couple of winters, we got it all together. And this is what it looked like before uh, we sold it to a Warburg collector out of San Diego. And he is having Steve Hinton over in Chino, California, rebuild the plane again. They actually took the plane completely apart over in Chino, they undrilled most of the skins. Replace the skins, all the nuts, the bolts, the tubing, uh, the wiring, completely rebuilt the airplane. We were there when I went over there a couple days ago, and they were just putting the wings back on it. Uh, in a couple of months, they hope to have it flying. So when anybody gets over to the Chino in the next couple of months, and they go to the Air Museum, I ask them to go over to the rebuild shop and see it as, as it's going together. Nowadays, Darrell uh, can be see, seen occasionally at the Thermal Airport, regaling all of us with the stories of adventure. He is also trying to improve his golf game uh, 
at his home course at Heritage Farms in India. At age 77, Harold has only backed off the gas pedal slightly. He's always thinking of the next race, or the next jump over it can retrieve one of his next old war birds. The great Murray Andretti once said, if everything seems under control, you're not going fast enough. That's he's about there. But I'll meet the man that knows. Come up on there and give us a few words and introduce our next legend. Dear Kelly, I'm not a former SR-71 pilot or RSO. I wasn't a member of your design team at the Lockheed Skunk Works or on the assembly line that built the Blackbird. Nor was I a member of the Air Force at Beale, Mildenhall, or Kadena who kept the Blackbirds flying. I'm not even an airplane buff in the classic sense. I'm just a person that had the privilege of being around your SR-71 Blackbird, and it was an experience I will remember intensely for the rest of my life. There's just something about your Blackbird, Kelly, 
that words don't adequately describe. Anyone who has been near a blackbird and felt its presence knows what I'm talking about. It's a feeling in your gut, and instantly you want to be part of it. Part of what I call the Blackbird family. Today, Kelly, you are being honored for your design work on the SR-71, and justly so. To me, the SR-71 is not only your greatest aircraft design, it is perhaps the greatest aircraft ever built. I've heard it said that you considered the Blackbird the most fascinating challenge of your career. No wonder. It was a design that was so advanced that everything that touched it had to be new. New manufacturing processes, new tools, new materials, a whole new approach. You built an operational stealth aircraft a decade before most of the world had even heard the term. It was a design so far ahead of its time that it retired before time could catch up with it. In times of crisis, the Blackbird provided six presidents with a unique and critical view of the world. The Blackbird served this country for just over a quarter of a century. In that entire time, it stood in a class of one. To me, the Blackbird is much more than a technical marvel. It's an airplane that gets inside you, an aircraft that causes the adrenaline to flow just by looking at it. Kelly, your Blackbird is the stuff dreams are made of. It's the model plane sitting in a young child's room, proof that everything is possible, that the sky isn't the limit. And it's the poster hanging on the office wall of a middle-aged engineer, testimony that yes, even in the real world, miracles do occur. The SR-71 embodies all that excites people about aerospace. Its crew seems part pilot, part astronaut. The Blackbird itself appears part airplane, part spacecraft. The typical Blackbird fan is a cross-section of America. It's your grandfather, your niece, your son. It's the wide-eyed young kid that buys an aircraft book at the National Air and Space Museum. It's the family that traveled hundreds of miles to an air show just to see a Blackbird in person. It's the people on the Air Force base that stopped what they were doing to watch an SR take off. Everyone, every time, no matter how many times they'd seen it before. And it's the pilot who last flew the Blackbird 20 years ago, who has the look in his eye that says, I flew the best aircraft ever made. The look that can barely contain the desire to get in an SR just one more time and light the burners. When Blackbird 972 made its final record-setting flight to Dulles Airport, I watched the television with mixed emotions. This was the Blackbird's final flight. An aircraft that was the very definition of speed and power would fly no more. But my sadness was tempered by the knowledge that this plane would now truly belong to the nation, coming to rest in the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Now millions would be able to do what I had done, be near a blackbird, be part of the family. Kelly, in the years to come, whenever I want to experience your airplane's majesty, I will remember the time I spent with your blackbird, the smell of JP-7 fuel, the feel of it on the soles of my shoes, the sound of an air starter wind up, the TEV ignite, and I'll put on the film that we shot during those incredible weeks in 1987. I'll watch it, feel it, be part of it again. Because in movies, Kelly, like in our memories, your blackbird will fly forever. Congratulations, Kelly, and thank you. Devin Hawker, assistant cameraman, Blackbird, the movie.
Testing, one, two, three, four. <laughs> well, it certainly is a pleasure to be here. I didn't know anything about all this. I just thought I was a mere attendee. And I saw my friend Daryl out there as I was arriving and didn't know he was involved in any of this either. Uh, everything that you've seen today, Daryl and I go back a whole lot more on everything. And I got to lock a little bit ahead of him because uh, I told me 104 in the military and I really liked it. And Tony LaPierre, who made the first flight on the U-2 in the 104, he was also known as Mr. P-38. Kelly Johnson was out that airplane when he was only 27 years old. And he really, Kelly, and is what I call the Leonardo da Vinci of aviation design. I could spend the whole, any amount of time I had here telling you all about him. And he was an inheritor of the uh, everything he designed, too. But um, uh, with this, when Greenmark got there, then uh, we, uh, I helped advise him on the 104. He'd come from Arizona, as he mentioned, flying 100s. And uh, then when I was in the skunk works doing the original stuff on the, uh, it was a single engine airplane. Remember, the U-2 originated as a CIA airplane. And so uh, it, that's what led to this Mach 3 stuff. And, uh, and of course, the CIA didn't know anything about buying airplanes, but they trusted Kelly Johnson so much they bought his U-2. And then that's still going strong today, but they could not, even though they've made it one with a larger wing and a bigger engine. But, um, uh, getting back to the, one, uh, the SO-71, when I got over there, then I got Daryl over there as well. Uh, and so uh, I had told him that, I said, what I suggest you do is you've flown the 104 now, and we used to chase all experimental flights, and that's a good idea to have a chase pilot on all, all of them, because we're so busy with U.S. instrumentation and everything. And so I said, what will happen here? And in, a, in a secret area, Area 51, I said, somebody will probably get killed, and then you move on up and start flying <laughs> to So that's how he got over here. And sure enough, uh, it worked. And uh, so then he got in on the uh, SO 71 as we uh, got into the development of him. And so I could tell you a whole lot more, but I think time is uh, of the essence here. So I better thank everybody for letting me just come here. It's a real surprise and a real pleasure to see my friend Daryl again, and we go way, way back, and I could tell you a whole lot more about him and me. One thing I will mention, uh, when we were flying testing the SO-71, uh, we, I remember one time we were in close formation, Kelly had authorized it, because you notice how far out from the center land of an uh, endless star, and when one of those things blows, they call it, a, call it an unstar. It puts the thing around and it's violent. And, uh, and when they first encountered it, uh, I was worried about catastrophic structural uh, uh, when it happened. But um, Kelly designed it, and of course he could have made it stronger, but that would have incurred more weight, and he knew he wouldn't get the range by putting out more weight. But Kelly, I mean, Daryl and I were the only, at any time, ever to have a flight authorized for to be in close formation, a lot of the Blue Angels. And you're taking a danger there because of either airplane had uh, unstarted then, you probably had a double crash. But anyway, uh, thank you all for letting me be here and so on and be here. And maybe I can get over here more frequently. Thank you.
I just wonder if you knew the pilot, the airplane, the, the fuel was taken in, and the airplane uh, cat uh, plowed the a runway, and uh, the airplane departed. And I just wonder if you knew the pilot, or you knew the story about it. I know nothing about it. <laughs> <laughs> Never happened. Any other questions? Never happened. <laughs> Never happened. <laughs> that, that's the short version. <laughs> you know, no other questions? <laughs> on no, no, all morning, of course. Let's ask Daryl if he's got any. <laughs> hey, Bob, what, what, do you, what do you attribute uh, Kelly's intelligence? I mean, how did, what's his background? How, how did he become so incredible in his design? Because you shared one time that something about the, the minimal, minimal uh, uh, turbulence off the back or something about the 104 and 71. Could you explain that a little bit? Why is, why is he so unique? The question is, why, what about Kelly Johnson? What do you, I could say about him and why is he so unique? The background on him is that he was born in upstate Michigan and he was from a very poor family. They were immigrants from Sweden. He was a pure-blooded Swede. Uh, later on in Europe, I was invited to speak over in Sweden at the place where they build their airplanes. Then chirping, they call it. And, uh, and I mentioned that uh, in one of the questions, I said, uh, where were his parents from over here in Sweden? And I said, well, I, we never talked about that. Even if we had, I wouldn't have known where it was. So I still don't know where the parents were from. And, uh, but anyway, he uh, was born in upstate Michigan. He came down to Flint, went to junior college there in Michigan. And then he, uh, he got into Ann Arbor and uh, University of Michigan, and they had one of the few wind tunnels in the U.S. then. And so uh, he said he had, had worked his way through school. And I asked him, well, how did you do that? Uh, uh, did you wait on tables, et cetera? And he said, well, a little of, of that, but primarily tutoring the dollars. And I gave you an insight into his persona right there, tutoring the dollars. And, and he got a job grading papers for the man who ran the wind tunnel. <laughs> so he learned more about the wind tunnel and when he got out here to uh, California to go to work for Lockheed right at the beginning of the Depression in 1932, then uh, I think he knew more about aerodynamics than anybody at Lockheed. And luckily for him, they had this Hall Hibbert guy whom I knew also. He lived in Glendale and he was the chief aerodynamicist for Lockheed at that time. And he was a gracious guy and, and Kelly uh, they had said, uh, we can't hire you the first year he went out, but how about going back and uh, go to Michigan for the next year, and maybe when you come back out, we can hire him. That's what actually happened. But they said, take this model and test it out in the wind tunnel, and come back and tell us, tell me what you think of the model. And Kelly tested it, and he said it was no damn good. And he wanted to go out there and be hired, however, and so it was a d dilemma of whether he should tell him the truth, and tell him it's no good, or actually that might prevent them wanting to hire him. But no, they hired him anyway. And they put him out. His first job was out in the tools section. So he, it was his curiosity. That served him greatly later when he was a, a designer, where he had to know about everything about the airplane, not just aerodynamics. Oh, he is an amazing person, and uh, uh, he's undoubtedly, the, in my opinion, the number one aerodynamic uh, designer in the whole planet. And the SO-71, as you may know, is still the world's fastest airplane for an air breather that gets its oxygen out of the atmosphere. Otherwise, you've got to be in a rocket, and then they have to have some special takeoff and a special place to land. Assuming that we need a definition, what is an airplane? But if you just talk about the, what most people consider an airplane, the SR is still the world's fastest. And it still is. And and uh, that's all I got to say about all of that. I hate to take too much time. I've already taken too much time. More questions. Kelly, tell us the, the story about the, why it's called the SR versus the RF. Uh, have you heard the question of uh, how did you get the name SR-71 when uh, some people said it's supposed to be the RS? Uh, well, here's what happened. JFK got assassinated and uh, back in the fall of 63, and so that made uh, LBJ, the, 
the uh, president. And so uh, he wanted to be elected uh, in 64. So he revealed the fact that we had obtained this capability. We were com in competitive with the Russians in those days, you may remember. That little thing known as the Cold War going. And so, and so, uh, the, and so, uh, what LBJ did, and uh, Kelly considered it treason almost, was reveal that we had attained high speed capacity, capability. Uh, because all of these other guys that would go say Mach 2, they, they get hot to it, Mach 2, and the faster you go, the harder things get. And, uh, and so, the, we had a, we were, he thought we should keep a secret about our capability. And, and the origin of the, the way I might interject here is that the U-2, while it go high, Gary Powers told me he was only 68,000 feet when the SAM missile got him with a proximity fuse. And, and he goes slow but real high. And so that, the origin of that was, Kelly thought, if I can design something that can go miles higher than the U-2, and um, then it ought to be and faster, if four or five times as faster than the U-2, we should have something that would be impregnable and nobody can shoot it down. And that proved to be true. But on the other hand, uh, we had to develop it to be reliable because if you ever had a problem and you could had to come downhill, low altitude, you could have been shot down by the Russians. But we never did lose any of them uh, uh, on the thing, and, and that was we did lose some in flight tests, however. And so uh, the story about the answer your question about the RS, um, it was supposed to be a reconnaissance strike, is what. Uh, Kelly had suggested they be called because at that time he wanted to make an a, a H-bomber out of the SO-71 and put a baby one in the right shine, that long, elongated forebody, and another one on the left side. And we'd already had something called the YF-12A, and we, it, you could go to 3.2 mark, and, uh, and then and, and, uh, it'd be at 85 or not, up to almost 90,000 and fire uh, over the ocean and it hit a missile coming in at 500 feet above the water. That was a huge project. And so uh, we could have had a, I think, and I think we should have had, uh, made an H-bomber out of the thing, and then we'd have had, a, instead of the mere triad against the Russians, that would have given us a great deal, uh, a new weapon system uh, to counter them. That answered the question. That was a, instead of the uh, a reconnaissance strike, it became the SR. So then they said, now we got to invent what does SR mean? And they said, that means strategic reconnaissance. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bob's uh, son, Robert, sitting over here. Robert told me earlier, he says, my dad can talk for 10 minutes or 10 hours. Uh, he, he'll be more than happy to stay around here after we're all through and answer questions, and we're very lucky. Now, I told you we'd have a surprise at the end of... Uh, uh, how many of you will have a birthday in the, this year? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I've got one coming up in February. Actually, actually it's February 14th. Now in time. And I'll be 91 years old, and I read in a very fine print of old bull pilots that one must retire 91. So uh, I told some off-color jokes today, and some uh, religious jokes, all in hopes of getting fired. But now we found that they're going to get rid of me, and we're going to have Blaine and the rest of the group. We've got a wonderful organization here in this old bull pilot. So. As long as you guys and gals show on up, you've got nothing to worry about because we have a wonderful staff that's going to keep this going as long as you want to. And it's been such a pleasure working with you all and, and enjoying you and meeting new people. Now I'm going to go out and take my little puppy for a little walk and uh, do, do, what, do what dog owners do, probably pick up on their stuff. Thank you so much. And it's been wonderful. Have a wonderful Hey, oh, oh, we we have uh, posters in the back, and uh, so if you'll take the time just to go ahead and sign these in order.
paragraph, and then we'll get them to our two wonderful speakers today, and then they can do what they would like with it. And we'll see you all in February. I'm going to go sitting in the back with the Restoration Boys and enjoy what you guys have enjoyed. We'll let the other, the rest of the group here run this organization. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week.